Firstly, we have Jamie King Scott, who is the Pine Martin Project Officer for Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, and will tell you about the Pine Martin reintroduction in the Forest of Dean. Over to you, Jamie. Marvellous, thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Now I'm going to share my screen. I'm told I've got power, um, which is fantastic. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I am Jamie, and I am managing the Pine Martin Reintroduction Project in the Forest of Dean. Just going to get my slides for you. Here we go. Now, I hope that if I click that, you can all see a rather neat and pretty opening slide. Can you see a picture of a pine martin? That's a good start. OK. Now, the challenge tonight is these talks that I normally give are about an hour long, if not more, because I, I ramble. So we're going to get it done in 20 minutes. And if, I, if I, I don't get it done in 20 minutes, you're going to shout at me. OK, right. As I said, I'm Jamie, Pine Martin Project Manager of Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. We'll get the basics out of the way first and foremost. That animal there is a pine martin. Not everybody knows that. A lot of people think they're birds because it's called a martin. Story goes that a few hundred years ago, we decided to change the spelling of the pine martin and put an E in there to differentiate it from the birds and spring watch presenters and various other martins around. So that's a pine martin. And I'm going to talk you through tonight a little bit about them as a species uh, and about how we brought them back to the Forest of Dean and the Lower Wild Valley. So this is our chat. This is the European pine martin. It's a member of quite a familiar family to us in the UK. It's a mustelid. We've got six of them. Well, six native ones. We've got an American mink as well, but we don't need to talk about him. Um, the six native mustelids, I'm sure you're familiar with. We've got the, the polecat, the stoat, the weasel, the otter, the badger, and then finally this chap, the pine martin. I like the uh, the mustelids. They're, they're, to me, they're the sort of Swiss Army knife of the mammal world because you've got you've got one for every occasion. You've got you've got the the otter that spends time in the water. You've got the the fossorial badger that lives underground, and you've got these guys, the martins, who are at least semi arboreal. They do rely on trees, but they're not pine specific. That pine in the name is a little bit of a misnomer. If anything, it denotes that you'd normally associate this species with more northerly climates where you'd find more coniferous pine forests, as opposed to their cousins, the beech martins you would find in more beech woodland, southerly climates, more broadleaf woodland, but they're not pine specific. What pine martins want is mature trees. They want those mature trees because mature trees contain lots of natural dens, uh, not, not lots of natural cavities and openings and holes, be they old woodpecker nest holes or points where branches have broken in. In those places, pine martins can den, they can nest uh, and they can breed. So that's why pine martins rely on trees. As far as which trees are concerned, they're not too fussy at all. Just needs to be nice, mature trees. But they don't just use that mature woodland that we talked about. They will venture further out into scrubland, into rough grassland, because they're an omnivore. They've got a really varied diet. They're what we call an opportunistic omnivore, which basically means they eat what they, what they, uh, whatever they find, whenever they find it. I do that some days. It's a, it's a very effective strategy. Um, then it works. It works really well for them. So to do to make the most of that, they will venture out, as I said, into rough grassland where they'll feed on voles. Voles make up a significant part of their diet, as do other small mammals. Their diet also includes birds, eggs, fruits, berries, insects, lots of different things. If our project is anything to be believed, they also quite like jam and uh, sardines, but we'll get on to that later on. They're relatively long lived. I never like to say how long lived a, a wild animal is because it's difficult to know. But pine martins can, all being well, live to about seven or eight, which is which is quite good going in the wild. Um, but they don't start thinking about reproducing until they're two or three. So it's, it, you've got to survive two or three years before you even start thinking about the next generation. You're not going to be going anywhere fast as a population, and we'll come on to that. They're mainly solitary animals. You don't often see two pine martins together. You don't often see one pine martin full stop. They're very elusive and principally nocturnal. But if you do see two pine martins together, it's usually a mother with kits or maybe a male and a female at that time of year. Pine martins have a have a wonderful trick. I'll mention it because it's here on the slide. They have something called delayed implantation. Now, delayed implantation uh, is a marvellous trick, which we usually see in species um, which do live individually. They live as solitary animals. So you can't guarantee when you're going to bump into another individual of the opposite sex. So when they do, they make the most of the opportunity. But in order to ensure that their young are born in the spring and make the most of that optimal foraging time of year, um, they will delay the implantation of that embryo until around January time. It's a wonderful little biological trick and pine martins make the most of it. They were 
once widespread in the UK, they were everywhere. That's not on this map. Don't look at this map and think they don't look like they're everywhere. I'm talking over the last centuries. But like many species uh, in the UK, they've suffered quite severe decline. I could be talking to you about any species tonight, and I would be quoting habitat loss as one of the reasons for their decline. Um, we used to have considerably more woodland in the UK, as I'm sure you're aware, and the clearance of that woodland started thousands of years ago, not just in the last few centuries. But with the loss of the woodland that we used to have in the UK, we, we, it has a ma it's had a massive impact on pine martins and lots of other species which rely on that habitat. They've also fallen foul of some, some historical persecution, all the way back to the, the vermin acts of the Tudor period, where predators were, were controlled um, to protect livestock and farming interests. And then from the 17th century onwards, when people started to be interested in game shooting, again, the pine martin was a potential threat to that. So they've been, they've been removed as a, as a predator and as a threat to people's interests historically. That all stopped in 1981, when they were legally protected. And that was enshrined in law in the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Among other species, these guys receive legal protection. It's now illegal to disturb, to kill, to, to recklessly harm, to, to disturb any of their denning spaces or any, any breeding uh, place that Pine Martin uses. Uh, so if I've spoilt your weekend plans there, I do apologise, but you, you, can't, you can't go out killing Pine Martins, all right? I'm telling you. Now, that was great for the Pine Martins. When the killing stopped, they've gradually, very gradually, shown a bit of a natural recovery. And I'll show you this as the, as the maps go on. You can see here, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we've not gone all night. Um, the, the populations in the southern areas of Britain, in, in northern England and in Wales, sort of lingered on a little bit, but really they weren't large enough to carry on. They, were, they weren't functional populations and they did drop off. But in Scotland, they, that population did expand. And in the early 2010s, when translocation efforts started to move martins from areas where the population was doing well to areas where they could live, but there weren't many there, you can see it started to fill out the south of Scotland and the north of England again. But the trouble is they can only expand so far. They can only expand by themselves as far as the habitat goes. And that's another big issue, as you can imagine. Why is it important that we restore the pine martin population? Well, I think there's a general understanding nowadays, and you'll hear a lot about this from the other speakers tonight, that it's important to put back these missing pieces of our ecosystems. Ecosystems, when they've got all the bits together, are functional systems. They, they produce lots of different outputs, some of which are, are useful to, to us as humans in terms of pollination and and flood water retention and air quality and carbon capture, all of these ecosystem functions, ecosystem services, um, only really happen when you've got all the parts together. It's like if you've got an engine and you've got parts missing, you've got parts missing out of your car engine, for example, you might get from A to B, but you've got no air con, uh, it might not be particularly safe and it's unlikely to be legal. So it's important that we put it back a lot of these pieces that are missing, some of them have been missing so long that we don't even realize they were gone. The beaver, for example, as you'll hear about later on, it's been gone for 400 years or more. Many people in the UK would have been scarcely aware that that was a piece we were missing. I and mean, you'll hear more about that later on. Pine Mart is because of their interactions with lots of other species within the, the, in, in, uh, the ecosystem through eating them mainly. Um, they can act as a bit of an indicator species by which we can monitor pine martins and thereby take the pulse of other populations because they interact trophically, as we say, by eating them with lots of other, lots of other populations. Pine martins are a meso predator, so they, they're not an apex predator. They don't sit at the top of the food web. There are things that will eat pine martins, uh, mainly foxes and maybe a goshawk. It's got to be a, a fairly decent size. In the UK, obviously, we've not got wolves or bears or anything like that nowadays. But because of that, what pine martins do, they have a, a predatory role within the middle of the trophic web. And that's important. That means that they can, what these guys essentially do is, is rebalance things uh, among the, the prey populations which sit below them in that food web. They'll generally move into a, a new environment and they will eat whatever is most abundant, thereby reducing that population and, and allowing those populations which were smaller and perhaps outcompeted by that, that, that initial prey population to rise a little bit. And they, they will rebalance the, uh, the, the rodent population or the bird population, whatever it might be uh, in that given area. Why reintroduce them though? Why do we need to go to this, this uh, extent? Well, as I've already said, they don't breed particularly fast. They take about two or three years to even think about it. 
And when they do, they might produce a handful of kits. Those kits have then got to survive another two or three years before they produce kits themselves. It's a slow process, which means that population growth, even though the law is now allowing them to do it, it's quite slow. Um, and as I've already mentioned, when we looked at those maps, as much as they like, they can expand and expand and expand, but they can only extend and disperse as far as the habitat does. At some point, those trees run out, that habitat ends, and there are significant gaps of hundreds of miles between there and other areas of viable habitat in the UK. So that's where we come in. We have to pick some of them up and move them ourselves to other areas where the habitat is viable. That's the slide that says the same thing, and I'll be honest, it shouldn't be in here. Now, the Lower Wye Valley and the Forest of Dean are one such area where it's a perfectly brilliant idea. Uh, it's a, it was a great idea, and it's a great area of viable pine martin habitat that those Scottish martins had no chance of getting to by themselves. It's a long way away, about nine hours drive, and these guys haven't, got, haven't passed their test yet. Whenever you're considering any kind of reintroduction project, there's, there's two key aspects you've got to think about. The first, of course, is perhaps the most obvious. It's the ecological basis. Is there viable habitat? Is there enough food for them? Well, our feasibility studies back in 2016 showed that, yes, we've got all that in spades in the forest. We've got about 170 square kilometres of suitable woodland. It's a real mix. You've got some mature woodland. You've got some scrub. You've got some rougher grassland. It's ticking all those boxes. It's got a good prey base. We found about four times as many small mammals. Like I said, they're, they're really something that pine martyrs are very fond of. Uh, as other areas where pine martyrs are doing well in Eastern Europe and places like that. So we've got plenty for them to eat. There's also potential for connectivity with, uh, with other populations. There was a, a reinforcement of the very small population in mid Wales back in 2015. So there's potential that those two populations could connect up in future. And that's exciting. The other key aspect, which is just as important, don't let anybody tell you it isn't, is the social side of things. You need to know that the local people are on board or engaged because they're the people who are going to live alongside these animals. Now, we were really pleased when we did our, our surveys amongst local people, the general public, and any stakeholders who might be concerned uh, about the, the, the return of the pine martin, that we had pretty widespread support. You can see there about 80% support from the general public. That's fantastic. I've got a graph I haven't included in that, but it's a lovely looking graph because it's all yeses and it's great. Few people said no. A few people were unsure, and we've been really keen to work with those people who were unsure or not keen on it, find out why, and allay their concerns. Many of the, those concerned were, were gamekeepers in particular. Again, from that historical idea that the pine martins may well be a threat to pheasants, which are part of their, their livelihoods, their commercial shoots. It's a reasonable concern. Um, pine martins might take pheasants, yes, if, if they stumbled upon them. But the fact is that People with pheasant shoes live alongside pine martins in Scotland and in Ireland and in other places and do it quite all right. They, the, the, the same adaptations which protect your pheasants from foxes are largely adequate to protect them from pine martins with a few extra adaptations. So we've been really keen to work with those, those people and allay their concerns and help them to live alongside the pine martins when they return. So with that in mind, we've got the ecological tick, we've got the social tick. We were good to go. So then it came to 2019 when we moved the first pine martins. We went to Scotland where the population was at its strongest, as we've already mentioned. And we were aiming to get around 40 martins. We thought the forest could take about 40 martins as a founder population. We trapped them in the, in the, uh, up in the, the northeast of Scotland, up in this area. Um, but before they can go, they've got to have all sorts of health checks. We need to know that these guys who are going to be our founder population, these are going to be the first martins in the Forest of Dean for 150 years or more, can't be sure. These guys are going to be uh, a nice, healthy, young population. We don't want any old ones because they're going to keel over within five minutes, and that's not good, very good for our founder population, is it? So they have a health check. They've been seen by vets. You can see in this picture down here. I bet when you woke up this morning, you didn't think you'd see a pine martin on a chopping board today, but there you go. Um, we were also able to lie them out like this while they're under anaesthetic. They're having their um, microchips fitted and a radio collar so we can track them afterwards. We can take photographs of, of these, these patches, these throat patches we call bibs, this beautiful creamy golden patch on a pine martin's throat. With the black dots and spots on, the brown dots and, and um, patches on there, those are a bit like a fingerprint and we can tell the individuals 
those individuals which you can see uh, we give really really thoughtful names like fd19 that's literally forest of d19 there's a, there's a lot of thought gone into that um the, the this guy down here he's just gone to the dentist so you can see he's lost a filling um i'm joking of course this chap is having his age assessed really his age and his health condition assessed if a mammal dies in the wild of natural causes of, of old age it's probably because their teeth are worn out teeth do wear down through an animal's life and so they're a good way of telling how old an animal is. This one, apart from his chipped canine there, is nice and young. And he was pleased to come with us. Then we had the very long drive. I said it was a nine hour drive, traveling these Martins down four at a time, down to the forest. And then came the big moment. This is the exciting bit. I, I, whenever I used to do this talk, I used to have an egg on this slide um, and I've removed it, but I've mentioned it now. So I've got to tell the joke anyway. The reason the egg used to be there was because we categorize releases as hard or soft, like, like a boiled egg. I, you don't need to laugh, it's not funny, that's why the joke's not in there anymore. But anyway, releases. Hard release basically means you're gonna let the animal go. If it's an adult and it's got an established territory, it's got experience in the wild, it knows what it's doing, you can let it go. With a younger animal, an orphan animal perhaps, um, or an animal moving to a new environment, a soft release is usually better, in which you build an enclosure um, to allow the animal to adjust to its new surroundings before you let them go. So back in the forest, thanks to Forestry England, we had a large area of land to work with um, and we were able to source some sites which were similar to the area these Scottish Martins had come from, so they didn't get complete culture shock. We wanted lots of places for them to go and rest nearby after their release. And then we built these, as I said, fancy, it's basically a big fancy aviary and filled it with foliage so it feels like a forest inside. And the Martins spent five days in there. They're being fed, they're being monitored on trail cameras in case anything goes wrong. By and large, I think they have quite a lovely time. And then, and then, ladies and gentlemen, and this is where we need a drum roll, the moment happens. This is the big exciting bit. This is where the Martins set foot on the forest floor for the first time in several centuries. That's incredible. And that Martin couldn't care less. He's got no idea as to the historical significance of this moment. There were no special words, no one small step for Martin or anything of the sort. They just... Uh, they just went, they just left us. But there we go. You can see there that they were fitted with radio collars and that helped us to track them once they'd gone. This is the phase of the project we're in now. So our final phase of the project, really. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to be speaking for much longer. And this is really, really important. When you release animals, it's not enough to just let them go and go to the pub. Tempting though it might be, you have to see that they survive. You have to see that they thrive. How do they get on? Where do they go? It's really, really important to, to get that information. So post-release monitoring with Pine Martins took really four strands. And I'm going to talk about the latter two principally, because those are really the bread and butter of our monitoring nowadays. As I mentioned, the radio collars enabled us to track those Martins in the first few months. And that's what my predecessor cat here is doing, picking up BBC Radio 4 in the woods. There she is with her antenna. Um, we've got den boxes fitted in those areas of the forest where... Um, the, the, the trees aren't so mature. Those areas of commercial timber, for example, where they're fir trees, they're much slimmer trunks. They don't have those natural cavities and maybe they won't get to an age where they will have those natural cavities. So we supplement those denning spaces with den boxes and we can monitor those with thermal imagers and all sorts of fancy bits of kit. But camera trapping and scat surveys are really, as I said, our bread and butter. Some of you I'm sure will be familiar with camera trapping. We use these all the time. They're a wonderful piece of kit when they work. Um, and these are our eyes in the forest. They provide wonderful glimpses of wildlife and behaviours that you wouldn't get to see otherwise. Um, we have these deployed by our wonderful volunteers. We've got lots of fantastic volunteers. They deploy these for us um, with a, through our camera trap loan scheme. We bait these cameras because all we're after is really to detect whether a pine martin is present or not in an area. We're not trying to capture natural behaviour necessarily. We just want them to basically take a register. We want them to show up and say hello. I'm going to fly through this footage, but it's nice to see. Obviously, when you're camera trapping, you get all sorts of species. We get some non-target species like this roe deer. There we are making an entrance. We get other animals after the bait. This is a fox. Uh, well, you know that's a fox. He's missed the bait. The jam is around the top of this log here. Um, this clip always puts the audience on edge. I can confirm, having seen the next clip that followed, he does get out of here alive. I promise. He looks like he's getting a bit stuck. It's almost you've been framed material, this, but uh, but he does get out. We get boar, lots and lots of boar. But if you're lucky, this is what you're after. About the size of a cat, 
This is the, the pine martin. This is the species that we're looking for. Now, this one is going to hop around a bit in the dark on this branch. And that never ceases to amaze me because you have to remember, this is pitch dark. These animals are remarkably agile. He's going to come back around now and he's going to scent mark. There we are. It's just lowering his body down and scent marking and off he goes. These trail cameras obviously also give us a particularly lovely glimpse into about this time of year when the uh, mothers emerge with their young. Here's mother with a collar. You can see her and here come the babies. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you guys that we've just confirmed that the pine martins have bred again this year. They've bred every year now since their return. This clip repeats and I'm so glad it does because it's the best one. They've bred every year since their return. And isn't that lovely? That's fantastic. We'll move on. Just a couple more slides. The other thing that we do to monitor our martins nowadays is scat surveys. If you're doing any kind of mammal monitoring, a lot of it will involve looking for poo. Uh, and that's exactly what we do. Pine martins like, I put there, they like poo with a view. And it's a wonderful way of phrasing the fact that pine martins like to, to scat in conspicuous places, to use the more technical phrasing. They like to deliver their, their poo in places where the scent's going to carry, because that's how they're communicating. They're letting other martins know, this is my patch, this is what mood I'm in, this is how healthy I am, male, female, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. It's a really, really important way of communicating for these martins, so they'll choose somewhere obvious to do it. That's very helpful for us, because it means that we can explore these tracks and, uh, and see if we can find them, um, which is, again, as I said, very, very useful. Pine martin scats are quite distinctive too, which is again, really helpful because if, you, if you've if you ever walked around the tracks in the forest of Dino or along any old, old forest railway, a roadway anywhere uh, in the country, I'm sure you'll find lots of different poos. There's, uh, there, you'll find fox poo, dog poo, um, occasionally a walker who's got caught out. Um, but we're, we're, we're grateful to the Martins therefore, that their, their scats are quite distinctive. They've got a, a quite a distinctive shape. You can see in there, the nice curl in that picture. Um, that's what's what's affectionately referred to as a as a moist classic. And <laughs> if there, that's a, I can never say that without laughing. But that's a moist classic, guys. Hope you've had your dinner. Um, and that's down to the pine martins' quite peculiar custom of every time every time they poo, they wiggle their bum. They wiggle their bum, and it comes out with a little curl to it, like a, like I was going to say, like a Mr. Whippy. I've said it now. Um, again, I apologise if you're having ice cream for dessert. Um, They've got also got quite a distinctive smell. So it's been described as quite floral, um, quite sweet, a bit like wet hay, wet fur. It often contains wet fur. The scats, like owl pellets, will contain the non-digestible parts of their, their prey. And some people, if you're wondering why that picture is there, say it smells like parma violets, which again, is maybe naturalist being a little bit generous. It is still poo we're talking about, but there we go. I'm going to finish up there. Um, all that's left for me to do is to thank our main forest our main partners on the project we have lots there are lots of organizations involved but forestry england vincent wildlife trust and the woodland trust have to get the the big the big credit here in the future well the monitoring is continuing we're working on connecting up the landscape more um to to enable our, pri our prime margins to disperse further across across the countryside we're hoping that we'll, we're going to build a, a resilient population like i said they're hoping to connect up with the mid wales population and as they breed uh, continually, we're hoping this population will become well established and nice and strong. Um, there's also, I put this in as a little footnote at the end, really. Pine martins are a, a lovely species. By and not large, they're quite enigmatic. Of the few pictures I put in here tonight in the videos, I think you'll agree, they're quite sweet. It's one of their big selling points, I think. And I wonder, therefore, if the conversations that we have around reintroducing a species like pine martins might be a bit of a gateway just to talking a little bit more about about reintroducing some other species that perhaps people haven't considered just a thought and i'm sure you'll hear lots more about other reintroductions tonight so enjoy um if you'd like to find out more about the pine martins you can email me um i'm sure yag can let you know my details or direct you to the project afterwards so don't worry about taking this down and if you'd like to find out any more there are some references there's a fab book about pine martins i'm going to breathe and you might have 30 seconds to ask a question but thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie, for telling us about the Pine Martins. We have a few minutes for any questions. If anyone has any, just put them in the chat and we will get them answered.
I have a question, Jamie, whilst we're waiting to see if anyone writes them in. So it's obviously a big involved process. How long did it take from deciding, yes, we want to reintroduce Pine Martins to actually getting those very first Pine Martins released? So that was the feasibility study started in 2016 when we first looked at, is this viable? Can we even do this? The first Martins arrived in the forest in autumn 2019. So that was three years from, from you know, getting those first, that first research, the first surveys done to actually getting Martins on the ground in the forest. Here we are in 2023, the project's running on until 2024. And now, yeah, we're monitoring. We're not bringing any more Martins down. As you've seen, they're breeding. They're, they're building up the numbers themselves. But it's, it's been a long process. That's great. Thank you. Last chance for questions, guys. You can always email me if you want to send yeah. questions. That's fine. Definitely. If you think of something later, you're like, oh, I wish I'd asked about Pine Martins. Then you can. Thank you again, Jamie. Um, if Hello. no one's got any, I put I put a question in the uh, um questionnaire. Could um Jamie answer it, please? Hang on a minute. Uh, sorry, Alan. I, I sorry. I'm I'm trying to see. Oh yeah. Oh, is it you, Stephen? Sorry, I couldn't see your question. Where about is your question gone? I can't see it. Can anybody see Stephen's question? If not, could you read it out, Stephen? Yes, surely. What about when we do find a pine martin scat, Jamie, yeah. and pick it up and take it away? Those scats are territory markers. Will they scat again in the same place? Yes, uh, it's a very, very good question, because you're absolutely right. When we do our scat surveys, sometimes we do collect the scats. Um, to, to do some more scientific analysis on it. Um, it's a very good point. And when you think about it, the Pine Martin might be a little bit irritated by the fact that we've taken the scats. He's taken so long with his wiggling bum and all sorts to deposit. But yes, they will generally, they, they have a territory, so they'll revisit the same spots and scat in the same places. So I don't think we're going to be impacting the individuals terribly. Um, in some spots, you will find several scats where the Martins return and use the same spot again and again. So I think if we take one, they'll, uh, they'll replace it, shall we say. Thank you. Oh, I think we have another one. Um, are there any other areas in the UK where pine martins are being introduced from somebody? There are, yes. Good question. Very good question. So there are this there there was a big pine martin, a national pine martin recovery plan drawn up back in 2014, I think which identified other areas of the UK where it might be viable to put some. And there are other organisations looking at it. Um, one in particular, um, Devon and Wildlife Trust are, 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 I believe, leading on a potential reintroduction on Exmoor and Dartmoor um, between Somerset and, and Devon, um, which should be quite interesting. They're at that feasibility phase at the moment where they're doing their engagement with stakeholders, with landowners, seeing what local people think. So they're at that phase. So as I said, it could be a few years before that happens. Um, but it's exciting. It's exciting. While those reintroductions are building, our margins are spreading. They're going to be they're going to be everywhere. Well, thank you. And um, there's one more from Trace who says, historically, did the UK have beech martins? Oh, very good question. Ex what a good question. Excellent. Um, so, yes, probably. Um, it's a little bit of a debated topic. Um, Probably we did. If you look back through the historical records, um, there was always a distinction in the records between white-throated martins and yellow-throated martins. And the beech martins do have a much paler bib. About 1800 and something, there was one particular naturalist, I forget his name, who decided, I don't know based on what, that they must all have been pine martins and therefore to count every record from then on as just pine martins. Um, but up until that point where he made that decision, um, certainly, there were records of two distinct martin species. Um, there's also nothing to suggest why we why we wouldn't. They have beech martins in France, um, so there's no reason to think why, why we wouldn't necessarily have had beech martins here. So yeah, very good question. 
That's great. Thank you, everyone. They were really good questions. I think that is all of them now. So oh. thank you again, Jamie. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, our next speaker is Alan, who is Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust X land manager, and he is our resident large blue butterfly expert. So I'll hand over to Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's quite a big title to live up to, that is. I'll do my best. And uh, I have lots of questions for Jamie there about poo, but there's just not enough time. So uh, we'll move on. So yeah, my name's Alan Sumnall. Um, I used to work for GWT until recently, and I'm going to talk about the large blue reintroduction to Dame Banks and the wider Cotswold landscape. So like Jamie, bear with me while I figure out how to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Lovely jubbly, right, if I be poshy, I should be able to get a little pointer. Ooh, look at that, very posh. Right, lovely, let's crack on. So, large blue reintroduction to Damey Bank. So this is Damey Bank's reserve here, which you can see. This is the cracking large blue butterfly. Very distinctive with these like paw prints on its um, upper wings. And remember this guy, this is an ordinary rare dant, which you can see in your garden. And this is a large blue caterpillar. And we're gonna find out all about just why this, how important this is um, to the large blue life cycle. So a uh, bit of a, like Jamie, bit of a real quick detour, um, real quick tour about what we've done. And I'll try to, um, I'll try to duplicate some of the theory around reintroduction, but we'll see how we go. So first of all, why did large blue go extinct in the UK? This here shows the former distribution of large blue, the blue dot. So you can see it's always had quite a restricted distribution and it always was quite rare. Um, and as part as Jamie mentioned, they have the wider pie martin plan. There is also the same for the large blue and it's broken down into these landscapes. So what I'm gonna talk about first is we're not the first to reintroduction in the UK. The first to reintroduction was here in Dartmoor then to the Poldens, and then up to us here in Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds. So we're gonna jump in here when the reintroduction project is already underway. But before we do that, we're gonna figure out why did they go extinct? So for those of you who didn't see Wild Isles uh, with David Attenborough, if you didn't, go and watch it and YouTube Large Blue Butterfly. There's some fantastic footage of what I'm gonna talk about now. And all that footage was taken at Daneway Banks over the last two summers, so do watch it. So this is the large blue life cycle here. Here's the butterfly, uh, like you all used to see it, and it does what butterflies do. It flies around and it looks incredibly stunning in our grasslands. The females lay eggs on the buds of wild thyme and also marjoram. That's important because the timing of laying eggs and the phenology of the plants has to be just so right because they lay their eggs in the really tight buds. So the caterpillars hatch and then burrow into the seed buds and feed. If it's already in flower, it's not suitable. So the timing and the phenology of the emergence of butterflies and plants is key. So the caterpillars hatch, they burrow in and they feed like caterpillars do for about three weeks. And then after this three week period, they purposely flick themselves on to the ground floor. And then what they do is they're waiting to be found by foraging red ants. And red ants are attracted to them. They've got a gland on their back like honeydew, and the ants absolutely love it. And they tap it up and they encourage the caterpillar to produce more. And then you must watch Wild Isles, guys. Um, the caterpillar then, through a, a series of fascinating stimuli, tricks the ant into thinking it's one of its own grubs. The ant panics. Oh my God, this is one of my lads. Picks it up and will run it back to the nest. And the caterpillar is then placed with all the ant brood. And then this is when it goes really, really, I mean, I, I'm still blown away by this every time I talk about it. The caterpillar is then a parasite of ant grubs. It will then spend the rest of its larval stage in the ant chamber, eating ants brood. And the ants are still deceived and thinking it's one of its own, but they will care for it until it grows in this like grotesque, like maggot shape. You can see the size of it now. It'll walk around hoovering up these grubs and the ants will still care for it. And then pupates in the nest, and then emerges as a, a butterfly the following year. What we didn't know, guys, is red ants, and there's some of the grasslands that we find here in the Cotswolds, you can get up to five species of red ants foraging beneath the wild thyme plant. Only one species, Myrmica sabuleti, is fully convinced. Other red ants, like Myrmica scrabadonius here, 
will not be convinced. They'll adopt it and take it into the nest chamber, but they'll figure out, wait a minute, something's not right here, and they'll kill it. Only this one species of red ant will in the UK. On the continent, there's four species of large blue, and each one has a specific Myrmica red host. It's an extremely tight niche. And this is what happened. This is the key to why the large blue went extinct in the UK. Right, bear with me now, guys. It's not as complicated a slide as it looks. On the bottom here, we've got years. So years zero to eight. At the top, we've got a management prescriptions. So we've got scrub. We've got if grasslands burn, close crop as if it's been grazed by grazing animals and ungrazed turf. And experiments were done when this guy was starting to really decline. We're talking about the 1970s now. Why was it disappearing? And surveys were done looking at which ants were about against which management's prescription. And Myrmica sabuliti, the species we need to adopt the red blue, is this red line here. So hopefully you can see that this, or sorry, I should mention, sorry, this is the this is the percentage of, uh, of the ant. When we've got close crop turf, it's the ant we need goes up and up and up. The minute it's not grazed, it drops. It's a warm loving ant in the UK in our, well, what was our cooler summers. It's a warm loving ant. And if it's ungrazed, it drops off. Whereas we look at a different ant species, which won't adopt the large blue, it does the opposite. When it's, when it's not grazed, it drops. When it isn't grazed, it shoots up. And this is what happens. This line through the middle is the plant that the, uh, the butterfly lays its eggs on. So that's pretty happy whatever. That can grow in ungrazed turf and grazed, but the ants adapt to it. So what had happened to us, we'd lost a niche here in the UK without knowing it. And the reason this had happened was grazing practices as they were before the 20th century have changed dramatically. There used to be herdsmen out in the hills with their sheep blocks. Everybody was employed in the country. That changed. But we got away with it until the 1950s, guys. And then we introduced this horrible thing called myxomatosis, which attacks rabbits. So the rabbits used to do this for us. We put myxomatosis in, we lost all our grazing, the ant disappeared, and then so did the large blue. Um, oh, that's just what I've already talked about. Sorry, guys, I should have put that up for you. And then just to bring it home, myxomatosis can be replaced by an, un an unsuitable host after only one season of undergrazing. And this can cause a mean sward height of only two to five centimeters. And UK sites, you know, the temperatures dropped by three degrees, and this is key. And what we didn't know was this. And unfortunately, Professor Jeremy Thomas, who was, who was um, studying this in the 1970s, made this groundbreaking discovery just as it went extinct in 1976. Way before all us lot here tonight, guys, but that was a real droughty summer, 1976. You may have heard your parents talk about it, and they disappeared. But then there was this big pull to get them back. No, we want this fantastic butterfly back in the UK. Um, so that's a little bit of why. So grazing is key. Jamie touched upon it a wee bit in his presentation as well. We've lost ecological processes, guys. Naturally, there would have been herds of, you know, auric and wild ponies, geese, all sorts of animals doing this grazing for us. It was then hung around because of farmers, but farming practices have changed dramatically. Um, so nature reserves as well may only be important for one part of the species life cycle. Many species require numerous habitat patches staying above the population. So despite best efforts to try and save it, you can't look after a species on only one little small pocket. No matter how well you manage it, it's always going to be vulnerable to extinction. And this is a, a fantastic quote, one of my favourites. It's David Gilson. Um, and it's no matter how carefully a nature reserve or habitat patch is managed, it's only as good as a network of patches of which it is part. So please remember that of anything you do, guys. Bigger, better, more join. That's everything GWT is all about. Bigger, better, more join, linking everything up. A really basic um, example here, guys, now bear with me. So this is some simple uh, resources that butterflies need. We've got um, L equals um, larva, what the larva will need. And N is nectar for feeding and R is roosting. So if we imagine this is a habitat patch here, if all we're providing is all lovely wildflowers for the butterflies to feed on, but we're not looking after these bits, the butterfly is going to disappear. 
So what we want to do is create these buffers to create these bigger, larger areas. And that way we can maintain a bigger, larger population um, over an area. And in case, you know, just to bring it home, a couple of lovely pictures. Here's a female egg laying with an abdomen dipped in the tight buds. And this is an individual roosting, guys. This is like a grass stem and they hang upside down. So we could graze the site as well as we want. Um, for, the, for the larval requirements, we can find loads of lovely wildflowers, but if we're not providing the roosting habitat, like longer areas of grass and scrub, think about today, guys, the weather, it's been absolutely awful. The, how many butterflies have you seen flying? Where are they going? They're not you know, clinging around these, they're, they're hunkering down in the vegetation, the shrubs and the scrub. We need this mosaic of habitats. We need, we need an intimate mix of scrub, of trees, of grassland. We, we need to get... Variety is a spice of life. We don't just want lovely wildflower meadows and a hay cup. We want everything in there with it as well. Um, I've got a weird white dot on my screen. We'll ignore that. Um, just a little bit to bring it home again. So I'm talking about the management here is, you know, the rich floral diversity, um, long fascinated biologists and plant succession, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, became familiar on these species rich chalk and limestone grasslands but scrub's a natural process. You know, in our management, what we do at GWT, we're preventing succession through the use of livestock, which are replacing native grazing animals. So I've got a time scale on the bottom there, guys. We're not gonna put any years in it, but we've just got an imaginary time scale. You imagine you've got a bit of bare ground. The first thing you see pop up are these pioneer plants. Think things like dandelions, really quick colonizers. Colonizers, you leave it a bit longer, you'll start to get a few perennial plants, things that will last a couple of years. Um, you go on a wee bit longer, you start to get shrubs start to come in, early colonizers, things like uh, silver birch, really good example, things like dogwoods, um, bramble starts to take hold. Before you know it, you get these shortly pioneer trees and then we get climax forest. That's a natural process, guys. That's what happens, but we've lost all the big beasties that stop that happening. And that's another reason why the large bee went extinct. Larger parts of the countryside just scrubbed up. If they weren't scrubbed up, it was intensive agriculture, but also back in those days, we had collectors. So what we want to do is try and get somewhere in the middle of all this. So when we have our volunteer work parties, I, I say, oh, sorry, we're catching a moment in spatial time. Yeah, so that's what I've mentioned. We're trying to get a little bit of everything. So when we have our volunteer work parties, I, I say, pretend you're one of these lads. Pretend you're a big beast with your lockers, with your saws, and we're going to try and mimic these lovely animals we used to have. You're going to hear about beavers shortly, guys, so we'll skip in. But we used to have things like bison. they push and knock and rub these over. We had wild boar, ferritin, creating pockets of bare ground. All this is gone. So one of the nature reserves that we manage in the Cotswolds, we're trying to create this disturbance. And this is what we want a little bit of this along a little bit of that. So a little bit of everything. Uh, we're gonna jump on the Daneway Banks now, guys, and why it was selected and why it's so important. Um, species which are improved grasslands, unimproved, bit of jargon. Those which have escaped modern agricultural processes such as plowing or fertilizers being added and pesticides. And you get these lovely wildflower mixes. You can get these, um, they become a variety of different colors and different species mixes, and not one is the same. Um, I was in there like there are rainforests here in the UK. You took a, a meter square quadrat, you get 40 species of plant, no worries, without even thinking about it. And they're just absolutely prime. The minute you put fertilizer in, you'll get nothing but nettles and thistles and docks. If you spray pesticides, it's you know, I'm not criticizing farmers at all, guys. I go to the supermarket and I buy my food like the rest of us. We have to work with the farmers to restore some of this alongside creating food, and it can be done. And you guys are the next generation now. You've got to take on this mantle for mold fogies like me. You've got to be speaking with these farmers and you've got to get this alongside us producing food, and it can be done. But with these, um, uh, these like 40 species, you get such intimate relationships. And I'm going to pick another butterfly now. I've mentioned a large blue. Our smallest species of butterfly is this fella here called the small blue. It lays its eggs only on kidney vetch. That's it, this one plant. And kidney vetch likes it in here. The minute we lose that grassland, we've lost this little critter. He's gone. And that's repeated for other butterflies, for moths, uh, for hoppers, for beetles. And if we haven't gone on the small lads, we'll get on the big ones. You know, what, what's feeding on these? We've got birds, we've got lizards, and they go on and feed things like pine martins. So we've got to start looking after the plants 
and then we go look out these little critters. No insects, we, none of us severe, we haven't got a chance. But this bit, because it's so important, we're bringing the large blue in, we need to make sure that we're not gonna lose all this. We're not single species conservation. We're looking after the habitat. Um, butterflies are fantastic indicators. That's why I love them, that's why I work with them. They'll tell you so much about the habitat and what's going on. They're fairly conspicuous, fairly easy to monitor and they just tell you a story that other things can't. Uh, Daymay Bank, so there's lovely Daymay Banks here. This is the reserve in the middle of the Cotswolds. It's 17 and a half hectares and it's designated as a triple SI, site of special scientific interest, but species rich unimproved grassland, nothing else, not the large blue. Uh, this was a privately owned site when, they, when GWT first got involved in 1968. So the trust have been managing it since that time. And in 2016, it was purchased jointly between GWT and the Royal Entomological Society. So it's now owned by GWT and, and RES, and it is, you'll find out just how special and important it is. You must all go and visit Daneway, all promise me you'll go and see what we've done and why. A um, little bit of NBC, it's predominantly CG5 community, and it's got everything there. Tall grass, I'm not gonna read this list, just to give you an example. It is absolutely alive with wildflowers and invertebrates, and it's a sight to behold. But it's on the, on the plant. This is a plant called Cutley Germander. There's only six sites left in the whole of the UK, and we've got it on Dane Way, and we've got it in ridiculous numbers. This is cut uh, self heal, last site in the county for this, for this species of plant. We've also got slender bed straw, last place in the county for it, really rich floristically. Everyone loves orchids, frog orchids, uh, fly orchids, bee orchids. We've got greater butterfly orchids, there's green winged orchids. It's just absolutely rich, but also away from the plants, away from the insects. We've got these beauties, we've got adders on site. These guys are in trouble. They've already gone from Oxfordshire. They've possibly gone from Wiltshire. They are in big, big trouble. We've got them on site. We don't want to lose them. So we're trying to look after small and smaller species and common species such as this. My favorite, or arguably my favorite species of bird, yellow hammer. We've got yellow hammers on site. They're their song. That's that little bit of bread in the cheese. That's these little lads here. I love them when I was a kid. One of my favorites. We've got rugged oil beetles. Um, they're also a parasite of solitary mining bees. It's just an absolutely fantastic place that's got everything and it was chosen for large blues because of the grassland and what it supports but i'm just gonna do a little bit about you know why you know how do we find out it was a good site so first of all i mentioned about the ants and the ground temperatures we've got what we call temperature data loggers in the ground this is just how we go about this was before the days of gps's i guess and what three words but there's a data log that's buried under the ground and we bury it so we can find it back. And that tells you how warm the temperature is. So before we put the large blues on site, let's make sure they've got a chance of making it there. So we do these ground temperatures. It tells you how warm it is, yet yeah, this site can support the ants if it's grazed, if it's managed. Um, Damien Banks again, and this shows you where we've got the soil temperatures. So dotted throughout the site. And then we also have an ambient one above, above um, sorry, in the air, tied to a, 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 bl a blackthorn bush no one can pinch it so we've got a wide um, scale not just one part of the site where it's good throughout the site so we then we do these surveys and yes we then we could find out it was warm enough to support them have we got the white ants guys do we have the ants um here's mark he was a long-term volunteer of the project and where we do the ant surveys guys is this is a little bit of trifle what we do is we put a little petri dish out we put a bit of sweet trifle or something similar we cover it up we we'll leave it a couple hours, we go back, and then we then, with a lens, we see what species of ant is, is feeding on it. And we put these baits throughout the site, and lo and behold, yes, the ants are everywhere. The ants have always been fairly common, guys. They didn't disappear, they just weren't widespread. And <laughs> going into the adoption process, the ants, they don't walk miles. This is a 17 and a half hectare site. The ants aren't going to walk from here all the way up there. They're going to forage on average 2.5 meters from the ant nest. So you need lots of larval food plants, you need lots of ants throughout the site. And that's what we needed to find out. And yes, we did have it, which is fantastic. Um, and then what we do is when we do this, 
we've done that bit now. We've found out we've got larval food plants. We've got the ground temperatures. We've got the ants. Then we do the reintroductions. Um, I struggled to find some footage that was <laughs> that would fit on the big screen like this, guys. So you have to bear with me. So what we do is when we reintroduce them, it's not as uh, glamorous and it's not as sexy as Jamie's pictures, but we release the caterpillars. The caterpillars are put down and they're then left to their own devices to be adopted by the first ant that finds them. So this is my equivalent now of Jamie's Pine Martin's jump in the pen. You ready for it? Drum roll. Ta-da! There is a large blue <laughs> caterpillar. And when it goes down, guys, you're talking about... 10 millimeters. It's absolutely tiny. It goes into the ant nest really, really small, and it puts on about 99% of its final body weight eating ant grubs. So we create a bit of bare ground. This it looks wet, guys. This one was in 2018 and that drought. We have to wet the ground to encourage the ants. It's put down and it'll walk around for a good while until um, a rare ant finds it. But that's as glamorous as it is. And you just wait and hope until next year that you see large blues on the wing. Um, so large blues are first put down to Daneway Banks in the early 2000s. I'm going to talk about when I joined the trust in 2014 and what we did to make sure this was a really robust population, not just, yeah, the large blues are there, they're doing all right. It's what do we do to make sure it was an actual humdinger of a site? So back to Dingley Banks Reserve, I've talked about grazing, I've talked about scrub control. I'm going to go into the management side now, just a little bit about, it's not just releasing them and then letting them to their own devices. It needs a bit more of a helping hand from us through targeted interventions. So one of the first things we did, this was Dingley Banks as is. The red boundary you can see is fencing and also around this little woodland block in the middle. So if you're going to graze with animals, you have to keep it fenced, otherwise they'll get out and there's roads and there's other animals next door. So it's fenced and we're trying to mimic natural process. Please believe that, that's what we're doing guys, it's mimicking natural processes. So the first thing we did was, right, we've got to get this site grazed. If we just leave this as it is, the animals will just stay in one area where they want to be. They might just hang around here. We want to ensure we get all the site grazed to get more red ants, to get more large blues on site. So we've put in new fencing compartments, which you can see here. I'll explain a little bit about them now. And we also put in water sources. Now we graze with ponies, guys. The ponies love it here, it's nice and flat. And there's some water there, so we can target them in here if we want to. If we left the ponies to their own devices, they'd stay there and they wouldn't do nothing. So what we can do is we can be rather cruel. We can shut this water source off. The ponies get thirsty, they have to come all the way down here to get a drink. And then as they come down, they'll be grazing this part of the site. So this is all purposely targeted where the water sources are to get the animals moving around the site. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not just about large blues. We've got these smaller paddocks here, as you can mention. None of these reserves are managed in isolation. We also think what's around us, what's in the wider landscape. You can make it a big pocket of woodland here and a big pocket of woodland here. So these pockets, are not grazed as tightly. That's more scrubby grassland. Some of the wildlife I talked about doesn't like short grass, things like adders. So it's not all like a bowling green. We just want that intimate mosaic, but we're just ensuring the site does get grazed. Um, yes, yeah, so these larger paddocks are targeted for Myrmica sabuliti, but the other ones are for more rough grassland. Um, also, because a site hadn't been grazed as well as it could have been for a variety of factors, remember, remember we bought the site now, guys, so we can do what we want with it. We also had a targeted plan of scrub control. So this has all been done now, guys. This is when I first started. Number one was a priority, and number two was a second priority. And the idea was to do scrub control to revert it back to grassland. So as I mentioned, we just pretended we were big bison. We pretended we were big RF, we pretended we were wild boar, and we were trying to get this back to be grassland. Um, of this grassland type, guys, you know, we've only got 1.5% left in all the Cotswolds. The 1930s, 40% of it was like Dingway, 1.5% left. It's worth the effort to try and convert it back. Um, so, yeah, I'll just going to talk a little bit about the scrub control and the fencing now. Pictures say a thousand words. Um, Oh no, I've got grazing first. I've jumped ahead of myself. So before we've done the fence, we've got the fencing sorted. 
No, we've got to get it grazed. We're not going to put dairy cattle on there, guys. This is all species-rich grasslands. It's as natural as you could possibly get in the UK. Um, things like uh, get dairy cows, they're used to grass, which has had fertilizer chucked on it. It's really lush. It grows really quick. And that way they produce more milk for us. It's also designed for beef cattle, which will put on weight quicker so we can get them to the arbiter to eat them. You know, again, I'm not criticizing farmers one bit, but modern breeds have been designed, been designed to get from birth to a produce much, much quicker. Not more natural bleeds, breeds haven't. And that's what we need for this more natural grassland because it's poor in quality. And we also want to graze in winter when nothing's growing. So the right breed is absolutely key. So the first thing to do is get the right grazier with suitable livestock. We don't own any livestock in the Cotswolds. We have some stock in the Forest of Dean. But when, I, when we first started this in Daneway, we didn't have any livestock. So we have to find someone who's got some animals that will put them on our nature reserve. Hardy breeds are needed, but we're asking the grazier predominantly to put the reserve of poor quality grass, predominantly in winter when it's not growing and we want dead grass to be eaten. That's not an easy ask, guys. Um, and we also ask them not to supplementary feed with hay or other. The minute you start giving an animal more food, you're, you're disrupting the natural balance we're trying to mimic. More food comes in, guys, that equals more dung. The animals are supposed to eat what's there, what supports them. The minute we start putting more hay in, we get more dung equals putting like fertilizer down. You also don't know where the hay is coming from. If the hay is coming from the other side of the seven, it could be bringing other plants with it. There could be potential non-natives in there. So we don't want to give it unless absolute emergency. Like think, oh, next picture talks about it well. Look at this snow here. This is all Daneway Banks. So we use these rare breed sheep. These are Cotswolds, Norfolk Corn, Wiltshire Horn. And if the weather's like that, and that's really thick snow, then we're not going to starve them to death. We'll give them something. But ideally, they won't. And these are Welsh Mountain Ponies. These guys are absolutely fantastic. They can be put on our reserves all winter. They need no jackets. They don't need any extra food. And they put on weight. They're absolutely brilliant. And if you follow the lineage back, there was close to a native breed of pony we had in the UK. And they're absolutely fantastic. So we've got a fantastic grazier called Judy Hancocks. She's from the Butts Farm in Sirencester. And she's been as important to making this happen to anything that GWT and Res have done on site. Um, so we've got the right animals, we've got the right grazier to graze it. Now let's make sure these ponies go where we want them. Uh, we've also supported here at GWT by fantastic volunteers. Anybody listening right now, if you want to learn what GWT does and, and how to you know, get, build your experience, come out and volunteer with us. We haven't got to do practical work. You could be based helping out with events. You could be helping with Claire and Jen doing educational activities. You could be helping Jamie with surveys. But come out and volunteer. I did it. And that's where you learn so much. But if you want to do practical work on the reserves, yes, please. I mean, it's fantastic fun. And here's a before and after. Hopefully you can make out this London plane tree here. That's it before and that's it after. All dense scrub guys, all cut back, new livestock fencing. We've restored some grasslands and now we can graze it. So this is what the volunteers have helped us do on site. We, it's been estimated by the large blue experts. We've doubled the amount of habitat on Daneway Banks through doing our scrub control. We want some of it to come back, that's absolutely fine, but we just don't want these big thickets that will just take out and march out and take over the reserve. Another before and after here, hopefully you can see this bit of a conifer here. There it is again, and now you can see the scrub control we've done. Look, no, notice the date, 2017. This has all been done back a number of years, but also when animals are grazing, they might come against this barrier of scrub. They'll think, oh, I'm not going through that. They'll turn around and they go back. If they can see a sight line through it, They'll walk through it and they'll explore and they'll nibble and they'll graze. And hopefully you can see we haven't cleared everything. You know, there's still some shelter uh, for, there's, you know, for, for animals in the harsh weather. There's still nesting for birds. There's still scrub for, for reptiles. We have dormice on site. Dormice use this scrub. It's trying to accommodate everything. So scrub control undertaken to ensure compartmental grazing achieved. Um, it's in, in sight lines I mentioned for livestock encouraged future grazing. We try to avoid linear edges, guys. What, how, 
wildlife, nature, whatever you want to call it, doesn't like straight lines. It likes wavy, scalloped edges. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create increased microhabitats and it's not eradicated, it's scalloped. We want these increased microhabitats. A really basic slide here, guys, just to show you, here's the sun beating down, different ground temperatures you'll get. This isn't for a glass, then it's more for heathland habitat. But you can just see the variety in temperature. And this might be where we've got our solitary bees. This is where we get things like our glowworm. This is where we get our large blues. If that was as flat and straight, you're only gonna get one type. Variety, a little bit of everything, humdinger. As I said, naturally we'd have big BCs doing this for us, but we haven't got that now. Jamie and the, the presentation here after me, we are gonna do it, but for now we're doing the best we can. Uh, moving on because of time. Um, just a little bit of a really crude phase one map, guys. I was lucky to do my master's at uh, Daneway Banks while I was working for the trust. And um, this was all a lot of a dense scrub at the time, which we've taken out. I was really interested in that roosting behavior. There's lots of stuff done on the larval stuff. So lots of stuff done on the caterpillars and the food plant and the rare down and the red ants. What about the adults? Where are they growing? When, where are they going to be now? When it's cold, it's going dark. Where do they go at night? Where do they go if it starts tipping it down? That's what I wanted to know. Where are they roosting? So this is a calcareous grassland. This is the scattered scrub. And I went out the GPS and I monitored the observed roosting sites. I'd be on site six in the morning for about nine. I then leave. I come back at six in the evening. I'd be there till the sun went down. And um, surprise, surprise, I found them all scattered around the scrub. So scrub is really important. And this is what's key about the Large Blue Project, what we've done. It's not just thinking, this is what we discovered in 1976. This is why they went extinct. We're always looking, we're always evaluating how are they now responding to things like climate change. It's a very different world than what it was in 1976. So although it's been a, many successes in conservation, they can be observed through restoration and reintroduction projects. A failure to evaluate can lead to a belief and experience or antidotal information of ecological research. So if you're sat there right now looking at all this, this is brilliant. There's still more research needed. There's, there's always more questions that come out of a good project and answers. You always want to know more. And then just remember again, roosted. There he is. There's a little fella. I've put the picture in, guys. That's the first large blue I ever saw on site roosting. So to me, it means, to you guys, it probably means nothing. But to me, that was like I was jumping up and down the air and fist bumping and moonwalking. You name it, I was doing it. Well, let's move on. Uh, so grazing the regime for largely butterfly is not having a detrimental impact. So although we've got the grazing, we've got the large blue, what about the grassland? How is that responding? So we have monitored it. So going back a few years now, because I'm going to come to 2016, you'll see why. This is very basic heat mapping, guys. So this is species density in a random square in the quadrat. And hopefully you can see throughout it, we've got a good mix of floral indicators. Um, Please bear in mind, there's no other variables measured here. It wasn't measured, was there a drought? It wasn't measured how much rain was there? It just looked on site how many there were. So we're still monitoring the site. And yeah, we've got the large blue arm. We've got this new grazing regime. But yeah, the, the floristically, it's still fantastic of indicators of the CG5 community. So we're still monitoring to make sure that triple site isn't going the wrong way. Um, and so has it worked? This is what you all want to know. So this is a slide I just peered between 2016. This is when it was first introduced to Daneway Banks. Now this looks quite demoralizing guys, just bear with me. That at the time was good. We were happy with that because a large people was being introduced and it was in low numbers and it was doing well. But it was still isolated on Daneway Banks and it was still a small population and a small population is vulnerable to whatever's thrown its way. Think of the droughts we've had recently. Um, you know, a small population on a small site, we don't want it. This is when we started to do so. If I joined here, we put the new, this was all in partnership with RES and funding through Grundon and management plans and Natural England have been supported by fantastic volunteers. The minute we put in the fence in, we got the right grazing animals, boom, it's absolutely shot up. And this goes to 2016, just to show you there. Now we're starting to talk real large population. I'm going to put up a few figures now, but in 2019, guys, we recorded the largest known population large blues in the world on Daneway Banks. 
Um, that's a, a massive achievement, which everybody at GDBT and Reg should be very, very proud of because it was only brought in early 2000s. And as I said, it was extinct and then brought in. The guys were, were brought in today where we came from Somerset. So I mentioned phonology. They were already a wee bit adapted, but it really got going. And then here's some other numbers for you here. So 2018, it went up to 160,000. So I, I made it, it was up here somewhere. Then 219, and you can see it dropped quite dramatically. Two things for that, guys. The first one is I mentioned about the size of the site. I mentioned about the red ants. The red ant nests can only adopt a maximum number if you average it out of 1.5 larva. If too many caterpillars go into the ant nest, they eat all the grubs and then the ant nest collapses and they starve. So if too many caterpillars go into an ant nest, then the ants just, they, they plummet and then there's not enough ants then for the next lot of large blues. Large blues try to get around this in that they're kind of ballistic when they're on the plant. So if there's two eggs laid on a plant, the bigger caterpillar will eat the smaller one. And that way, hopefully, only one caterpillar gets adopted. So this is perfectly natural. We were way above carrying capacity. And then dropped again. But if you can think back 2020, guys, this was lockdown year. If you can remember we had no rain, but pretty much all a lockdown. And that had a huge impact on the plants. They all shriveled up and they all died. There's no effort for the caterpillars to lay their eggs. We've bounced back because we've got such a large, robust population. So for it to be able to survive, this is a huge, if it was these small numbers, it wouldn't have. But we've got a really large population here now. And it's now being used, Daneway is the donor site for other large blue reintroductions in the Cotswolds. So large blues are being reintroduced to other former sites because they will get there naturally. We, we want to help speed it along. I mentioned Bigger, Better, More Joy, and that's the Jamie. They have naturally colonized other sites. I'm not going to put a map up, guys, because some of it is on private land holdings. And for now, it's, it's just we want to keep it careful. We want to keep it close because, unfortunately, collecting still does go on. But Daneway Banks and another site nearby are by far the largest known population we've got anywhere. And that's a fantastic success. And then another slide for you quickly here. This goes back to the 1950s to when the large blue went extinct. And this is UK colonies known. And you can see it went extinct reintroduced and by 2010 we were well above colonies in the 1950s this is now shot up a lot lot more there's more colonies you know we're talking you know dear me 50, 13 years ago now and the large blue is flying in large numbers it's believed to ever have done we'll never know um, but educated guesses you know certainly when it was known to people and to scientists it's flying in better numbers than it ever has done and now the, the plan is, yet yeah, we want it throughout the Cotswolds, we want it throughout the Poldens, and we want it throughout those other sites. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a little bit of a, the side of the management that goes into play in it for things like large blues and some of the interventions we have to take because of natural ecological processes aren't there. I'm just going to finish, as did Jamie, with a big, big thanks because the strength of the large blue project is many organisations working together in partnership. So here's GWT and Res than in Daneway, but like I mentioned, our large blues came from Somerset, the Natural England have been involved, the National Trust, um, Habitat, like people like Biffa, um, Lottery Funds. This is the strength of the large blue partnership. And as you would have seen from what Jamie was talking about as well, trying to do things by yourself, guys, is hard work. If you can work with partners and you can be collaborative, you'll get a, you'll get a lot more done and you'll get a lot more success. I think that's me done. I hope I haven't been too long. Yes, I'm done. That's great. Thank you so much, Alan. That was really brilliant. Really, really interesting. Um, I think just just for one question from Trace, um, where where is the pollen? I presume they mean like within the flower. Where where does the pollen live? <laughs> uh, so yeah. So if you're on about, sorry, I'll the large piece of nectar on any plants so they'll they'll go out and butterflies do and they'll pollinate um, if you're asking about the larval stages there's like a little tight bud if you imagine that the bud and the caterpillars will burrow into it and they'll eat everything they'll eat the developing pollen the seeds the lot that's what caterpillars do they're like walking eating machines 
That's great. Thank you so much. Oh, Trace meant the Poldens. Where are the Poldens? Oh, so they're in Somerset. Uh, so Jamie's neck of the woods. Uh, they're down that way there. Um, some of the sites down there, there's Collard Hill, which is natural National Trust site. Uh, Green Down, which is a Somerset Wildlife Trust site. So those are the two, the two big sites. Uh, Green Down, the Somerset Wildlife Trust site, is particularly fantastic. Um, it's a bit more difficult to find. Um, Collard Hill is a bit, a bit more easy to access. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Isabel will introduce you to our final speaker now. Okay, so now we're going to hand over to Cheryl Marriott, who is the head of conservation at Cornwall Wildlife Trust, to tell us about the beavers. Mute myself, maximize the right screen. Can you all see that? I can't see you anymore. And is my sound okay? Yeah, that's great. Phew. Right answers. Okay. Right. Good evening, everyone from, from Cornwall. Um, I understand you're about to get a feasibility study um, looking at beaver reintroduction in Gloucestershire. We've had beavers down in Cornwall now um, for, for six years, in, mostly in fenced enclosures, and that's what I'll talk mostly about. Um, but there are some wild populations on the River Tamar, on that river that divides um, Devon and Cornwall. So we'll talk a little bit about the animals themselves. Why, why is there such a fuss about uh, bringing these animals back? Um, just touch on some of the science that X University have been doing on, on these reintroductions. And then a bit about what our, our next um, steps are as Cornwall Wildlife Trust, just to hopefully give you a bit of information about um, what, you know, what it could look like in Gloucestershire, what, what might this mean for you. Um, so just to make clear right from the beginning that the reason we're interested in bringing beavers back, it is about what they do. It's They are great creatures themselves, they're really fascinating. Um, I'm not fed up of talking about them even after six years of doing so. Um, but it's all for us about the State of Nature Cornwall report that is as depressing as a State of Nature report anywhere else, um, with showing the a clear decline in, in species and our Cornwall climate change risk assessment as well. So we're looking at how can we make uh, the, the best bits of habitat we've got in Cornwall, how can we make them more resilient to these weird weather patterns that we're now getting. So that's just to make the point that we, it's re there are really good reasons for, for bringing beavers back and it's it's all about these um, documents. This is out of a book by Bryony Cole um, called Beavers in Britain's Past. So and the, these dots are evidence of, of beavers um, from back in history. Um, we've got one little dot down in Cornwall, which was the bone fragment. You can see that around your area dots, and, and I did a different in particular. So they are a native mammal. Um, this is the Eurasian beaver, and they most definitely were in your area before we made them extinct in Britain by eating them and harvesting from the, them for fur and, and castoreum, this substance that they sent Mark with. Um, was used as a, a medieval medicine. So they were very useful to us, too useful for their own good, really, and, um, and they, we lost them all. Thankfully, they survived as a species in other parts of Europe. Um, so the, the dark brown blobs on here, it's a bit out of date now, this, because it goes up to 2015, but the dark blobs are where beavers um, had shrunk back to in, in 1900. So a few over in Eastern Europe, still in Scandinavia, and a little tiny population in Germany and in the south of France. So they'd shrunk back most to the to wetland areas where they were harder to find and harder to hunt. But thankfully we had some left. Same kind of pattern over in the US with the American species, um, over harvested, but now on the way back. 
So it's, it's, it's good news. We've, we've been through the difficult bit with this species and now they're coming back in a big way. Here's one of the Cornwall beavers. This is the female. You can tell because she's got pronounced teats. Um, and this is to make sure I remember to tell you about what they eat because they are herbivores. Um, in the summer, they're eating grasses and herbs. So any sorts of flowering plants that they can get their paws on. They'll eat water plants and they'll come out of water for 10 or sometimes 20 meters to feed. And you can see her, they're chewing away on bramble. In the winter time, they're much more reliant on bark as a food source. And this is what they do to, to willow trees, just scrape it all off. So they've quite rightly got a reputation for felling trees or coppicing trees because these trees do grow back. The, um, our classic riverside trees coppice very readily. So willow, aspen, alder, poplars all grow back very readily. Um, and if you think about it, that's because you know, hundreds of years ago, these, these trees had to put up with beavers. So their response to that um, when they co-evolved with beavers was to be able to send up shoots very quickly and regrow. Um, it's not a, the clearest map ever, but this is from the from Tayside in, in Scotland. Um, a map of sightings as the escape and this just shows how main river systems and just burrow into the banks when it gets really interesting is when they're pushing up into the smaller streams um, and make territories there because um, that's when they build dams but as a family unit highly highly territorial and they'll fight to the death to keep other beaver families out of their patch this is what the Cornwall site, the first um, fenced beaver project in Cornwall looked like before. Um, there's a oak plantation to the left, which had been a bit knackered by grey squirrels. Um, you can see the stream there. It's about a metre wide, and about 10 centimetres deep, but very grown in with brambles and very not much light getting in there and not an awful lot of, uh, of plant diversity because not much was going on in this site. It needed some chaos and uh, dynamism, which is exactly what the beavers have brought. Put two beavers in in 2017, um, and they had the weekend off, and then on the Monday they started building, and this is what we first saw, just a little quite innocent line of sticks and plants. And within a few weeks, that had grown to this size. And this dam now is holding up quite a big body of water behind. They've added further dams. They haven't stopped building um, since that first weekend. And now we've got a whole series of dams and calls. Um, and there's a classic uh, beaver lodge. So they've got underwater entrances to get into that lodge and that makes them feel safe from predators that aren't even there anymore, but they don't know that, that we've got no wolves and bears. And this depth of water thing is really important because when they're on, when they end up in a territory with not much water, um, they don't feel safe from predators. And that is the signal to them to start building dams. And that's when it gets really interesting. Um, it's not ever so clear, but there's a dam running where that big that trunk is. There's a dam running away from you there. So this, this pond here is all beaver created. This is what they do. This is just panning round to one of the more new, the newer dams, which is in the foreground here with the, the vegetation growing on it. And you can see the pool behind and that pool has actually um, killed some of the oak trees that are there. They felled some of the oak trees there, but also because oaks don't like to get wet feet. And they don't cope very well with, with having these beavers back. Um, so it's kind of carnage, really. But but even that, whilst it, 
with all the tree planting that, go, that is going on, you can think, well, crumbs, do we want these animals to, to fell trees? But the habitat they're creating is extraordinary and the impact that they've had on other wildlife, which I'll come on to, um, has, has surpassed our expectations. We could build dams. Um, this might be on the River Froome, actually, in, in Somerset. Um, we, we can build dams out of woody debris ourselves, but we've got to pay people to do that. They won't do it as well as a beaver and they've got to go and maintain it afterwards. And there's a carbon cost to this by getting machinery in. Beavers work 365 days a year overnight and then for free. Um, so there's a, in the States, they, there's a, one of the sayings is just let the beavers do the work. And they're big animals. We're talking a big spaniel kind of size. It's a tiny clip of, of them building a dam. They'll carry sticks in their jaws, but also in their front paws. They can carry armfuls of mud and, and waddle along on their back feet. Here's one of the kits from a couple of years ago. They, they are a rodent, um, but they just have one one um, litter of kits each year. So they're not, not breeding like um, as frequently as, as other rodents. That's why I put the kit in there to remind me to say that. Okay, just a quick bit of the, the science part of it, because um, University of Exeter have done a lot of work on several of these fence trials. These are results from a Devon fence trial, but we found the same thing in Cornwall. The graph at the top has got is showing us the rainfall events and then two different colour lines. One of these is the flow coming into the enclosure um, above the beaver dams and one is below. And we've pulled out here in the, in the inset there is, a, is one rainfall event. So the blue peak is what happened after the rainfall, the, the level of water in the stream above the beavers goes up very, very quickly and then goes down quite quickly. Now, if, if you're living downstream and you're affected by flash flooding, this, this is a big deal. And this is what catches people out. Now, because the water with all the beaver dams in place has to flow through over multiple dams through multiple pools, it's really slowed down. And that's what we're seeing there in the red line, that the flood peak, so the maximum flow, is about a third of a, from above the beavers. I hope, I hope I'm making sense. The beaver dams make it more complicated. They slow the flow down. So as a natural flood management tool, um, we're really interested in the impact that beavers can have. On the left here, you can see the top diagram, you've got the line of the stream and the early dams that they built just picked out the perpendicular lines. And then below that as the dams a few years later. So you can see the complexity, the number of pools held back by a whole series of 13 dams. And this is in about two hectares or five acres, so it's not a big area. As on our nature reserves, we'll, we'll build ponds, we'll get diggers in to create these wetlands, but it's, it's a huge amount of cost and effort, and here the beavers are just doing it. The graph on the side there, no surprise is that over time, the surface area of water, um, so the amount of pond surface grows, as does the volume of water, as you would guess, with, with ponds being created. The important thing about that is it's not just the water held in the ponds, but the soil all around becomes wet. The site becomes a big sponge. And that means in drought conditions, the stream still flows. In the drought we had last year and the dry period we've just had, down at the beaver site, you, would, you wouldn't have had a clue that there was, that there was any drought. You just, you just wouldn't know that it was happening. So both extremes of climate in our river systems, very, very high flows after heavy rainfall and low flows during drought beavers can help to moderate and take the sting out of both of those. This is in Oregon and there's a lot of interest in the states bringing beavers back to to restore rivers for bringing salmon back in but also to try and um, reduce the spread of wildfire and to provide wildlife refuges during wildfire 
and that's what you're seeing here. Um, that's a long way away and you could feel like that hasn't, hasn't got much relevance to us, but I don't know what it's like in Gloucestershire, but in Cornwall a couple of years ago, we've had two of our nature reserves going up in smoke. Um, so this is a growing concern for us. At the same time as the, the dams helping with low flow and high flow, the act of slowing the flow means silt drops out of, of the water into the bottom of the pond. Uh, um, is from the stream above the beavers, beaver dams. So, so they're also having this effect of, of cleaning up water as it goes through. It's not um, impacting on the cause of that pollution, but it's certainly helping with the symptom of it. So what's not to like with these creatures, really? Um, I'll come on to some of the more negative things in a minute. It's not, it's not all, all good news, but mostly it is about benefits. Just a quick bit about the impact on wildlife. Here's a little little um, inlet in the main pond with lots of older trees, just to show what these animals do. The beavers took a liking to those saplings and munched them all down. Um, but look how much light they've let in as a result. And we're finding that the botanical diversity goes up where the light's let in. They'll also chew these little beaver lawns, these areas into the bramble and allow other plants to, to, to get going and the, the diversity of the plant life increases and then that has a knock on positive growing back and you can start to see other vegetation coming in. So they're creating clearings, they're building the dams, they're building ponds, we then get side channels flowing around the edges of the dams, we're getting new streams flowing where there weren't streams before real dynamism and chaos which is what we've lost from most of our landscapes because us as humans have simplified everything so this is putting the animals back in control um, and the results have been really mind-blowing we've had we've got now 11 species of bird that we hadn't recorded on the site before including things like water rail um, willow tits We've, this is now the most westerly population of willow tits. That's one of our rarest birds. They excavate nesting holes into dead willows. So all of the dead wood now that's lying around is, is perfect for them. This is what they've been waiting for, for us to bring the beavers back. Um, breeding grass snakes are back on site. The polecats are there. I couldn't tell you that's definitely because of the beavers, but it was an in interesting that we've never seen them before. And then they, they popped up. We've done small mammal monitoring and I thought small mammals might miss out because of the, the ponds taking up their existing habitat. But we've got more species and, and higher abundance of species of small mammal now. Harvest mice have moved in, water shrews. We followed up with the water bowl reintroduction because we'd lost all the water bowls from Cornwall back in the 90s. There was a reintroduction in, in North Cornwall a few years ago, but now where we're putting beavers back, the habitat for waterfalls is absolutely perfect. Um, dragonfly numbers have gone up as well, amphibian numbers, um, bat species, we've got 11 of the 13 bats that, that we would expect to find in Cornwall are now at this site. So you name it, the wildlife has responded and that's why there's all this fuss about beavers. And we, we talk about them as being a, a keystone species because their activities on these small streams have this knock on impact for so many other species. And that's why we're putting our energy as Cornwall Wildlife just into getting beavers and more beavers. Beavers outside fences, hopefully. More of that in a second. I think I've covered all these well, the brown trout have doubled in size in the ponds. Um, eight dams, leaky dams, six new ponds. And we love taking people around. We've taken over 4,000 people around the site now on beaver walks. OK, just jumping across to Germany for a minute. This is Bavaria. I was lucky enough to go on uh, one of Derek Gow's study tours a few years ago. This gives you a real flavour of the extent of what beaver created wetlands can look like. Um, 
but there's productive farmland each side and that's an important thing to note as well the biggest impact of having these animals is the low-lying flat ground because that's where one beaver dam can create quite an area of pond um, if it's a wildlife trust site happy days um, if it's a seed potato field understandably um, farmers and landowners are, are not going to be happy here's a close-up of the dam there and you get these natural overflow channels forming and there's still concern from anglers particularly my um, anglers of sea trout and um, salmon so the migratory fish the ones that need to travel up and down the rivers um, there's anglers concerned that that beaver dams would be a barrier to, to fish passage but you can see here as long as we give them enough space um, these natural channels form and any kind of salmon would be able to get up, up there no trouble at all in the in the states you can buy bumper stickers um, that say beavers taught salmon to jump which makes complete sense beavers and salmon coexisted very nicely before we hunted out the beavers there's another part of Bavaria and I don't know if you can see there's a there's a ribbon of, sort of pools and wetlands down in the bottom of that valley again productive farming on each side so where we've got hilly landscapes and I'm pleased to say in Cornwall we we are pretty much hilly everywhere we don't have areas big areas of flat ground um, so if we can give the beavers a bit of space in the bottom of those valleys that's all they'll need and then we can enjoy all of those benefits that, that the beaver dams provide and this is just downstream of where the Cornwall beaver project is the, the fenced enclosure that I've been referring to and if we just flip between those there's not they're not so different the topography there so it's quite easy to imagine um, if we can incentivize the farmer here to to give up a bit of ground along the stream there in the bottom um, which generally isn't the most productive land anyway it's not the best part of the farm if we can incentivize them to give some space up for the beavers then then society as a whole can enjoy those benefits that I talked about earlier. So how do we manage beavers? If we get beavers out more widely, um, the good news is 27 other countries in Europe have had them back already. So any of the problems that beavers can cause are, has already been dealt with. There are tried and tested techniques that we can bring here. Um, for example, there's a nice witch elm tree and we've painted the base of that tree with pva glue and put sand into it and that puts the beavers off so any particularly special or important or sentimentally important trees we can protect them with techniques like this it's a bit like when you're on the beach and you get sand in your sandwich and you just don't really want to eat it this has the same effect the beavers just can't bear that feeling of sand on their teeth we can also put wire mesh around trees. This is, is a good technique as well. Where the water level gets too high in a beaver pond for the landowner to be happy, um, you the, could take the dam out. You might need a license for that if it's below a breeding lodge because um, they are a protected species now. Um, in extreme circumstances could even trap the beavers and, and move them somewhere else that hasn't worked so well in Scotland because it's set a precedent with the landowners now that that's what they expect um, what um, Natural England is trying to do for the licensing down here in England is to really encourage um, coexistence so you can use these things which are called flow devices or beaver deceivers so it's a long tube goes through the dam and um, it's covered in a wire mesh at the inlet so the beavers can't block it and the beavers aren't sure what's going on so they keep building over the top of the pipes but you can control the water level and this is much better than moving the animals away or continually removing a dam um, 
because that's never end, a never ending task then if you do those things if you take a beaver out another one in time is just going to come and replace it so much better to just learn to live with the ones that you've got and learn to coexist with them um, the one on, these are both in Scotland the one on the right hand side is next to the mainline railway um, so it's un completely understandable that they'd want to control the impact there because you, what you don't want is beavers burrowing um, into structures like railway embankments because um, they are big burrowers nearly finished so this is part of one of our nature reserves um, south of Bodmin in Cornwall and and we are now now that we've been involved with beavers for six years in an enclosed situation we're interested in getting them out in the wild on this nature reserve so we've just taken on a beaver officer who's going to be over the next 12 months pulling together a, a license application um, if the government actually says yes they're open for applications because at the moment they're not um, but we're going to go ahead and get that information together in the hope that they hit the green button on on wild release licenses. And this is a site just nearby to that and um, just to show you some interesting mapping which is available nationally now so you, you should be able to get get hold of this. This is this is a model that the University of Exeter put together called the Beaver Dam Capacity Model and what they've done is add habitat information together with um, stream size and shape and they've come up with a, an estimate for how many beaver dams per kilometer you get on any given stream. So what we're seeing here in the red is the highest um, prediction of between 14 and 40 beaver dams per kilometer. So this is a way of, it's really fascinating to look, at, I've been looking across Cornwall at where beavers would do their thing Given that all those positives I was talking about were from an enclosure that was two hectares in size, could you imagine what we could have if we got more territories along these streams? Um, and just, I think it's probably my last one. So that, that's the beaver dam capacity model for Cornwall as a whole. Um, so numerous beaver territories would, would just be extraordinary. It really could make the difference in terms of nature recovery for a lot of species um, if we can figure out how we can live together again with these animals. Um, there are obviously that it's a big change or people are concerned and we've got to really take that seriously. I, none of the issues are, in, are a reason for not doing it is where I've got to with my thinking. They're all, they all need to be um, looked at seriously and we need beaver management plans ready to deal with those issues. We're working on the government to try and get them to incentivise landowners to make space for beavers. Devon Wildlife Trust are doing a trial um, paying a landowner to allow the beavers to, to do their thing and the landowner gets a payment per hectare. This is the kind of stuff we need to do because as a society it's really good value way of getting, getting nature back and and having flood prevention and um, ameliorating drought conditions as well. So yes, there's some issues that we need to look at. Not everyone's going to be happy about it, but it's that just shows we've got to do it in a careful and responsible way. It's, it, it isn't a reason for not doing it. Um, any questions? As, as Cheryl said, we've got some time for some questions, if anybody has any. Or any, I'd be interested to know what you think about getting these animals back for Gloucestershire. If you haven't got questions for me, I can ask you questions. What's the, what's the, is there consensus or... Oh, I think, you... think we've got one question is how big is a beaver's territory? It's a good question. It depends on the habitat quality. 
and that's about 200 metres of stream. So it's, it's winter food supply, which tends to be the limiting factor. So it could be a 200 metre length of stream. If the willows are more sparse, they would need a bigger area. Good to know. Um, see if we have any others just for a minute. We've got one more here. What are the main issues that cause people in the general public to object? It does tend to be um, anglers, although they're, they're coming around, I think, the anglers, because they they want to see that the, the climate positives, you know, the moderating high flow and low flow, because those things aren't good for fish. Clean water is clearly very good for fish. Um, and the complexity of habitat is quite good for fish because it gives them lots of places to hide. So I think the more they learn, the, the, the more they're coming around. Um, I, then I guess it is, it's, it will be landowners and farmers who would be directly impacted by, by beaver ponds. Um, it's a shame how things happened in Scotland on the River Tay, that the beaver population built up from an escapee population. It built up very quickly. The Scottish government was a bit behind on getting, getting organised and getting good um, beaver management practices in place. So I think the farmers felt a bit um, like, oh, here's this animal and we're not getting any support. And then they got protected. So they're like, oh, great, I've got all this damage and now, not, and now it's protected and I can't do anything about it. So it, we're learning from the issues that have happened in, in Scotland um, so that we don't jump too quickly to translocation and moving beavers or, e or even keeping on removing dams when we don't need to, can we use flow devices? So um, yeah, that, that's the, the main issue is, the, is lo that localised flooding under beaver ponds. Whilst the communities downstream benefit, there's, there's local impacts. I've got another question here asking if beavers adapt to new environments easily? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, they they would occupy back in the past. They've been from here right across China, dry areas, wet areas, mountainous areas. They're unlike other species, because if they find themselves in a territory that doesn't suit them, they'll change it by building dams. So that meant that they could colonize a whole spectrum of, of places that um, I think they're down as far as Mexico now in, in the States, so getting into quite dry areas. And, and some of the areas we know of as dry wouldn't have been as dry back in the past when they had beavers in them. So very adaptable. They live in Munich airport in the drainage ditches. They're in town centres and city centres. Um, yeah, they'll be everywhere if we give them half a chance. We've got... Another question here asking what would be the biggest threat to beavers if they're reintroduced? That's a good question. Um, well, they haven't got many predators left. There are things that will take the kits. Um, even otters have been have been taking beaver kits. But I, I don't think that would be a threat in itself because we've got the habitat. We've got the... And they'll... Yeah, they'll, there'll be things that limit their numbers, but I don't think that anything will be a big threat. But probably people and dogs or getting run over will be the new thing that they haven't had to cope with before. Right, we've got one last question here asking what's the beaver capacity numbers for Cornwall? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. I'd have to work that out. Um, Gosh, we've, there's family blah, thousands, but I couldn't tell you. I'd have to get back to you. On thousands that one. is good. Thousands, yeah, is thousands good. let's stick with thousands. <laughs> okay, we should we okay to wrap up now, Evie, would you say? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for all for coming to the talk. We hope you're armed with more information about how reintroduction projects can benefit us. 
the talk will be available on the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust website to watch anytime. So do share with any friends and family you've got. If you have any further questions about reintroduction schemes or the animals we've talked about, we would be happy to answer them on the emo in emo email info at gloucestershirewildlifetrust.co.uk.